Okay, John, a team, you guys ready? Yeah, I think we're ready. You may proceed. All right, good morning. Uh, we are Project 18 Automated Microgreens, and this is our final presentation. So just a brief overview of our project. Uh, there's been an increasing demand for microgreens due to their high nutrient concentrations, uh, but consumers can find it difficult to find markets that actually sell the product. And where they are, they're usually priced at a high premium. So our need is to design an automated growing environment that can produce microgreens with little human intervention. And we do this by modulating the environmental conditions inside the device. And this way the growing cycles can be optimized. This project will serve as a prototype slash test bench for the future development of a consumer product. Uh, <clears throat> this is our final design. On the right, you can see the CAD model and on the left, you can see the assembled product. The assembled product is 100% accurate to the CAD model. Next chart. Yes. Yes. All right, and now here you see our system level diagram. This has not changed very much since the last time you saw it, but the one change is that we are using four load cells for each growing area instead of two. So just the basics are gonna be the structure on the right, the climate control system next to that, the growing area system, the control board, nutrient pH control, watering system, and the lighting system. And you'll hear a lot more detail about each of these systems in the preceding slides. Okay, just looking at some more max. Mm -hmm. All right, so for our final design, we'll start out with the nutrient and pH control system. Uh, this has three main uh, subsystems. So in image one, you'll see our measurement tank, uh, which is a 3D printed enclosure that's waterproofed using resin. Uh, and then in the top, we have a pH sensor, an EC sensor, and a water temperature sensor. Um, and the signals from all those sensors are gonna be sent over to our main control PCB, which you see in image two. Uh, and this has the pH and EC breakout boards, as well as a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, so the breakout boards will send their signals through a ADC and then eventually into the Pi 4. Uh, and then in image three, you'll see one of our two uh, peristaltic pumps. This is driven by a stepper motor. Uh, so if the control board senses that the water quality is out of spec, it'll activate one of the two peristaltic pumps uh, to change the set points in the water tank. And over on the right, we have our lighting system, which is housed on the Pi Zero printed circuit board. Also on that printed circuit board, we have the weight sensor breakout board, which houses an ADC, the temperature and the humidity sensor, and all of the DC to DC converters to step down to 20 volts to drive the actuators and the Pi Zero. We have two PWMs for both the red and the blue in order to reach our desired intensities. It just occurred to me you guys could create a fish tank solution. Yes. Yeah, you know? Yeah, oh, yeah. I actually suggested that a few times. What's that? Our roommate suggested that. Okay. And here you'll see our final design for the structure on the left side. So this structure is made of quarter inch by one and a half inch aluminum tubes, which were welded together. And then, so the wood roof is on top, and you have a storage compartment in the middle top row. The other four, the other five compartments are growing areas. Each door has a magnetic latch and is made of quarter inch ABS plastic man mounted with a steel piano hinge. In the bottom middle picture, you'll see a little more disassembled state where you can actually see the growing area dividers in the storage compartment. And our final dimensions are 42 inches high. 34 inches wide and 20 inches deep, which fulfill our requirement for being less than half a meter cubed. Uh, for the climate control, control system, the system needed to cool and uh, heat the air between the temperatures of 55 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. The ducting airflow flows through the fan, through the swamp cooler uh, slash heater, and then gets distributed through the manifold duct. The cooling system has a peristaltic pump that pumps water to the water chiller the heat is then removed from the uh, heat transfer case. 
um, as shown in the bottom middle picture, to the TEC cooler, to the heat sink where the heat is dissipated by the airflow. The treated, uh, the treated air, sorry, the treated water is then fed through the swamp cooler to be evaporated. Uh, this was done to have more efficient cooling. Water and drilling area in the top left, so there's a nice to the frame with tubes coming from the inlet manifold. Can't hear who's talking. <clears throat> Hello, hear me now? We can hear you. You're just pretty quiet, Connor. Oh, really? Okay, I'll speak up. All right. Here's the watering and growing area in the top left. So are mounted to the frame with tubes coming from the inlet manifold and leaving to the respective growing trays. Below that is a picture of the water tank. The tank is made from adhered ABS sheets with supports inside to prevent leaks. Quick connect adapters are used to connect the tube to the growing tray. A sliding lid is used to access the insides of the tank secured with a latch. Caster rails underneath, allowing the tank to be slid in and out. On the right, the growing tray and frame are shown. These are coated with an FDA approved resin for waterproofing. Underneath the growing tray, the low cells are mounted with the 3D printed housing. Elbow adapters are shown fastened to the bottom of the frame. Yeah, still just looking at it, Connor. Yeah, I appreciate the detail in the final design. You guys showing all the subsystem components. That's very helpful. All right, so we're going to walk through uh, some of our fabrication assembly steps uh, by uh, process. So starting out with the Hoff, um, in image A and B, you'll see the water chiller uh, being milled in the Hoff and then being assembled onto its uh, coolant. Uh, in image C, you'll see the drain manifold being tapped in the Haas. Um, and moving down to DEF, this is our uh, nutrient gauge bottle cap. So D shows it in the mill, and then E is having it fitting and the straw installed, and then F is it uh, installed onto the bottle. Uh, down in G and H, you'll see our uh, door hinges being machined uh, using a wooden fixture in the Haas, and then finally being pop riveted on to the ABS door. Uh, moving over to the prototrack, we have our water tank assembly process here. So in I, you'll see us uh, milling the quarter inch ABS on the prototrack, and then J is uh, partially assembled uh, with two of the panels there. And then K was our, our first leak test of the completed water tank. <clears throat> Uh, moving down, you'll see the structure tubes being milled. Uh, so we made a wooden jig to hold all of the tubes. Then we used the Predatrack to uh, cut them to length and uh, drill all the holes in them in their respective locations. Uh, and then in M, you'll see the left side of the structure uh, assembled on the jig table. Uh, N is the tubes being TIG welded together. And then finally in O, you see the completed structure uh, doing our load bearing test. Here's another steps for fabrication and assembly, these times using the water jet. So in the first image A, you'll see our fan cover mount and peristaltic pump brackets being water jetted. And then B and C are those brackets bent and then mounted onto the water tank assembly. Pictures D, E, and F are going to be the climate control system. So D is going to be the um, galvanized sheet metal on the water jet. E is going to be the um, the bracket, or sorry, the uh, sheet metal bent and mounted onto the fan. And then F is the manifold mounted onto the duct. G and H are going to be the covering for the outside of the structure. So G is the plastic on the water jet ready to be water jetted. And then H is the final cut um, plastic riveted onto the structure. On the right side, you'll see the steps we had for 3D printed processes. I and J are gonna be the plastic 3D printed mounts for the LEDs. K and L are going to be the 3D printed grow trays. K in K, you can see a, um, a growth being done. And then L is gonna be just the, um, just the tray inside the tray holder. M and N are the plastic receptacle covers for the power mount. Um, these are printed in PC ABS on the machine shop printer. And then O and P are two other um, machine shop printer items. 
O is going to be the peristaltic pump, and then P is going to be a miscellaneous kind of array of just one of the batches we had printed. Was there any machine in the shop you didn't use? Probably not. Yeah. I think we used every single one. I think so. And moving on to system performance, we start off with the climate control. On the top left, we can see our desired set point for our climate control. And you can see it oscillating between a high and a low around that set point due to the climate control turning on and off. And on the bottom left, you can see the external temperature. Uh, you can notice a, about a five degree delta between the two temperatures and the internal temperature in the way of the fan. So it sort of oscillates as well with the climate control. And on the right, you can see the fan turning on as the cooling system boots up and the, the TEC, uh, sorry, the parasaltic, parasaltic pump after the fan. Yep. This is always the issue with closed loop control systems, right? Going overshooting and undershooting, but it seems pretty reasonable that those delta differences, that was, is that within your spec to hold it within half degree? The options, yes, we had a spec of uh, plus or minus two degrees Celsius. Okay. Uh, oops, sorry, could you go back for just a minute? Yeah. No, sorry, uh, I was going to talk about how the graphs were made. The graphs, so they display the set of measurements from the start of a growth cycle to the current point in time. Uh, so when the tray page is accessed, it fetches all the sensor data for a specific tray within the cycle time period and it feeds it to a JavaScript library and that creates that graph. Yeah. Okay. Okay, here the wall system is shown filling up the grow tray through the inlet hole and then draining afterward to the large outlet hole on the right. Below is the graph of the launch cycle based on the speed. Rock receipts operate at 10 minutes off, 50 minutes off, with six beats at 50 minutes on, 45 minutes off cycles. Beats have a longer watering time than the larger seed size. All right, on the right side, you'll see two graphs uh, verifying our pH and nutrient system. <clears throat> uh, so the upper one shows the EC of the water tank uh, for this given period of time. Uh, so we have a set point of 260 EC, uh, and you'll see the EC starts out near like 28 uh, and is measured for a while down there. And then once the uh, dosing system is activated, the EC starts rising, and then it eventually levels out uh, right around our set point of 260. Um, and then a similar thing for the pH. Uh, the first readings came in around 5.95, uh, and then slowly the measurement, uh, the dosing system brought that down to our set point of 5.6, and then we'll hold it constant at that level. All right. So to uh, this. Uh, what you'll see on this page is the process to start a new growth cycle. Uh, to start a new growth cycle, you go and you click on the tray portal. It'll come back around here in just a second. Uh, and then that will lead you to the tray information page. At the bottom of that page is a button to take you to the tray control page. And on that is a form that'll allow you to select your desired microgreens. And then you can hit the start growing button and that uh, creates the records in the database required for a new growth cycle. And then it, the, the control system takes over from there. Okay. Uh, so these are uh, five of our total 40 requirements. Uh, and we just picked the main ones. The first one is that the micro, uh, the device needs to produce two cups of micro, microgreens within a three-day harvest window. We're currently still in progress in verifying this. Uh, the lighting system uh, needs to be greater than the 15 daily light integral and have a ratio between 87 red, 10% blue, and 2.5% 2.5% far red. Uh, this was verified through the LED data sheet uh, and controlling the intensity of the and controlling the intensity via PWM. Uh, the nutrient pH. Uh, system needed to deliver water between a pH of between 5.5 and 6 and a nutrient density between 150 and 200 per, uh, ppm. And this was verified uh, through the sensors on the machine. Um, and then the next one is that the aggregate your, uh, growth data should be continuously available, which is what Daniel was talking about earlier with the user interface. And finally, the electrical components needed to have an IP resistance, uh, IP56 res uh, resistance. 
uh, this requirement was not met. Uh, out of the 40 requirements, 28 were met, 10 are in progress, and two failed. Are you guys doing anything about those two? Um, yeah, we need to like reprint, 3D print them and then like start try to code them again, but I'm not sure if that'll make a difference. So is that something you guys are gonna do between now and Friday? Or what's the plan? Um, uh, we currently still need to talk about that and okay. uh, we still need to verify the other 10 before we do that. But you guys have until Friday to give me an addendum for any of these 10 or those two. And Did you guys want to narrate this as it's being shown, John? Um, yeah. So essentially, it's just showing like some, the steps involved with growing a growth cycle. Uh, so you'll see like the climate. We put like a fog machine through the climate control system, so you can see how it like sucks in the air and then distributes it to each of the growing areas. Um, and then you saw like to start a growth cycle, you just sprinkle the seeds on the mat and then uh, place the tray inside. Um, and then this was a time lapse we took of the latest growth cycle um, of them growing. How long did it take for these to grow? Uh, so this is day six, I believe, um, is what this image is. Okay, moving on to lessons learned, we need to make sure we commit all the parts with the food safe epoxy resin, making sure to add several coats and get the right ratio for the resin to cure properly. As with all resins, a proper cure is essential to gain advertised results, as there could be some talking to the issues in the future if not cured properly. Weekly meetings and progress checks were essential to ensure accountability. There was also an in-depth file structure and labeling scheme created early on, which proved effective. For manufacturing, many designs required rework as well as practicing techniques such as bending sheet metal before making final parts. It was essential that parts had to be easy to manufacture, especially those that needed to be made several times. Having common parts saved time and complexity. Understanding the theory behind tenders and actuators is a very important step as well before designing the actual circuit. And then for coding, we want to keep to or attempt to keep all the devices on one serial network so we avoid doing duplicate work. Uh, keeping the feedback simple uh, aids in product development time, particularly in testing when we want to make sure our product is within spec. And making all the codes scalable helps us make it so we can change the parameters of a particular system without doing too much rework in the code. On mute. Uh, just a brief summary here of our whole semester. Uh, so we did most of our manufacturing between February 2nd and April 3rd, uh, and we ended up manufacturing over 230 parts. Uh, and having complete drawing sheets in December uh, allowed us for like a very quick transition from design into manufacturing. Uh, and all of our parts were machined uh, in the SCC machine shop or in EIS 106. Um, we tried to have around 95% of our device assembled uh, before April 1st, and this allowed us to start working on system integration uh, as early as possible. Uh, most of our PCBs, or all of our PCBs, came mostly assembled from JLC PCB, and we just had to add uh, things like uh, connectors to them. Um, 
having common fastener sizes made assembly uh, pretty straightforward because uh, everything essentially used the same parts to put it on. <clears throat> uh, we did have some minor rework kind of across the board, uh, just little things like having to oversize some holes or maybe trimming the edge of a piece of sheet metal uh, to fit it in. Uh, and in a few cases, uh, like adding a resistor in line in our wiring harness. <clears throat> For testing and verification, uh, we bench tested each system individually. Uh, and then once we had it functioning on the bench, uh, we placed it into the full device. Uh, and we verified our full system uh, through uh, a growth cycle with all of the subsystems um, like playing into that growth cycle. Uh, and then all of the testing we've been doing, we've been accumulating data uh, from all of our sensors uh, that we can use to like tune the device to get future growth cycles to work uh, better. And then on our lessons learned, uh, realized that small hiccups in the manufacturing schedule are cumulative and actually end up pushing back the entire schedule quite a bit, uh, even with very small mistakes. Uh, our original plan of brazing the structure together, we realized is just not practical for a large 3D structure. Uh, and that's why we ended up switching to the TIG welding. Um, and we also learned that uh, waterproofing 3D printed parts is a pretty challenging process uh, and should probably be avoided uh, if possible in future projects. Thank you. Hey, John, uh, appreciate this. We have had teams that have created 3D printed parts that are waterproof, but of course you're putting in O-rings and those sorts of things. Um, there is some uh, uh, O-ring, there's at least one O-ring supplier put you know, on campus under the supplier page if you want to look that up. So I'm assuming then by Friday, you're going to send me an addendum for the the 10 in progress and the two failed requirements of what you're doing or what you got done? Yeah, do you want that just in the final report or do you want us to like update this presentation and send it back to you? I don't want this updated presentation. Of course you put it in the final report, but what I'm looking for on Friday is like, you know, a page or something like that showing, you know, here's what we did. So this is giving you the full time, right? That's the idea. Also, Dr. Abraham was present this morning he had to jump off. He put a chat message on. He's interested in the cost of the system. So I'd recommend that you send him a separate email copy of me to answer that question. Okay. Okay, thanks team. I uh, scanned through it last night as well. And I thought the presentation showing all the different parts and how you put it together was really well done. It is interesting to reflect that you probably did use this by every machine we have which you know, just indicates that this is quite a system that you put together. It's one of those things you can't judge a book by its cover, so to speak, because it's fairly complicated with all the different components, right? So uh, well done on communicating you know, all the different parts that go to that. I appreciate the EC engineers being on as well and sharing in the presentation. Thank you, team. For the feedback.